Insurance Junkie Podcast, episode 30. Welcome to another episode of the Endurance Junkie Podcast, the show where I will be interviewing some of the fastest, smartest, and most inspiring people active in the endurance world today. After being honorably discharged from the British Royal Navy and involved in a serious bike accident, Christopher Brisley decided to start running, swimming, and biking for the greater good. He is the founder and CEO of Take a Challenge, a community organization that inspires people to get active while encouraging others to do the same. Chris. Thanks for taking the time to chat here today. Now, before we start talking about takeachallenge.org, can you maybe give us a glimpse into your past and your sporting history? Yeah, um, really quite simple. When I left school at 17 years old, I joined the Royal Navy, um, where I spent the next 10 years doing various jobs from operations and intelligence and uh, various exciting and sometimes unexciting but very challenging roles. And during that time, I was also um, a a highball diver. So when I had chance, I would get back to my training camp and train in in, uh, Plymouth with Andy Banks, who actually trained Tom Daly, the Olympic athlete. And um, that was sort of my my carrot, if you like. If I wasn't doing my military role, I was always doing the sport. And and the two very much were very difficult to try and work together. They were both quite demanding. Um, but then the big key for me was in 1996 when I was medically discharged from the British forces and it was, um, it was quite traumatic. I had absolutely no idea what I was going to do. I'd literally signed up to the Royal Navy for 22 years, so uh, a bit of a shock really. I had um, uh, a respiratory disease. Uh, which I didn't have as a kid, so no idea where it came from. And a lot of doctors now will call that asthma. Um, and and that that in itself was quite a challenge being labelled because I, I was in I was in quite a state actually. You know, I actually even got labelled disabled with something like thirty five percent of of my own bodily function due to the the level that it got. I literally couldn't be near anything synthetic. I couldn't do any exercise, so the diving went out the window. Um, I couldn't, um, I, I couldn't eat some foods. I couldn't sleep properly. So, and this went on for years. So, um, yeah, it was quite traumatic. Plus I didn't have, uh, any qualifications. I had no clue what I was going to do. Um, so do I did what any normal person would speak to the doctor, you know, once, once I left the military, gave back my ID card and, um, realized I was a civilian with absolutely zero of anything. It was like, it was literally starting all over again with absolutely no clue of how the world outside lived. Now, it sounds very bizarre, but you are very much in a bubble when you're in the military, especially the sort of roles I was in where I would just disappear for hundreds of days at a time. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I just took tons of medication um, and it got worse. Uh, and the consistent and, and the problem with the healthcare system we've got at the moment is we're very good at labeling, and, and also society, we're very good at labeling people. So, you know, we turn around and give someone a label and, what, and people tend to believe it. And I, I now know, um, and I don't think this is an assumption, I know that that labeling process, you know, calling someone fat, calling someone disabled and saying they've got a serious disability and that you can't breathe properly anymore, you, you end up taking that on board. And I actually got, I got worse. So despite, despite the medication, I ended up on more medication. I became severely overweight, um, became a, a pretty, pretty difficult time. And um, after a while, I just sort of had a realization that the, the only way things are going to change is if I change it myself. So I went out and within, I think it was within two years, I ran the London Marathon in sub four hours. Um, and I started to notice that my breathing improved, you know, and I was like, hold on a minute, I'm not supposed to be able to do this. Um, so and during that time, I also retrained and you know, ended up moving to London, um, ran my own business as an IT consultant, something I've never done. So that that grabbing my own life by by the horns, if you like, and just recreating life every single day was was my new way of doing it. And uh, and I got a massive love for running all of a sudden. So basically, people people tell you that you've got this respiratory disease, um, you, you have trouble breathing, and then it got worse. So you think it's like a combination of the, the medication and then your own mental state of mind that 
go, that yeah. made everything go worse? Well, you, be, you become reliant on something outside of you. So the, the thing outside of you is the medical system and the pharmaceuticals that you need to, to exist, if you like. Um, you know, I was literally on steroids every single day, um, multiple colors of inhaler. Oh, and I know many millions of people are, live like this on a daily basis with a full belief that they can't heal. Um, and, and I really was bad, you know, I, I, the amount of times I was um, in, in hospital with, with b barely able to breathe and plugged into various machines just to keep you going. It's, it, was, uh, it was traumatic for my parents, it was traumatic for various friends who saw that. So, yeah, I do believe that our mind, not just our mind, but our entire whole being, when we have a certain mindset about something, it, uh, it has an impact on the way that we live. Um, and, and I think it's getting worse in the way that we, we live as a collective in terms of what we, what we live and breathe about how we believe about life and about ourselves. So, yeah, it did. It definitely did get worse. But that, that, whole, that whole belief system that I'm going to change this, I'm not accepting what I've been told, rather, it is due to my stubborn nature, I may point out, but that stubborn nature then transferred over to something quite positive. Yeah, so, so what actually made, what was the trigger for you to, you know, start training again and, and uh, switching things around? Well, when um, I tried to become a diving coach um, and that, 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 there really wasn't any money in it. I really enjoyed it. I got some kids could do really well. And I opened, so at the same time, I opened a sports shop, so which was selling triathlon, running, swimming, apparel, all the sort of endurance stuff. Because I noticed when I lived in Devon, where I, where I was from at the time, um, there just wasn't any real sports shop. It was all just fashion type shops. So, um, and then um, that that crashed. I just lost every single penny I had. And I, th there was nothing left, if you like. I was in massive debt. Um, I had, I'd lost everything I had financially. I'd already, already lost my the, the job that I'd signed up for for the rest of my life. And now I had no health. And when you're at the bottom, the, the, my realization of the only way is up was was quite a biggie really and I thought you know what the I'm going to do this myself and I started walking and then I started running with some of my friends joined a running club and over a few years and I had to carry my halo and I had to take the drugs constantly it was I had to teach myself how to breathe as well it was it was a whole new experience but um, and I'm not saying it was easy but I, but it was better than doing nothing it was better than accepting what was happening at the time no. So what did you do when, when you lost the, the, the sports shop? Uh, how did you get uh, yeah income after that? Um, well, I, I worked in warehouses. Um, one of the um, one of the suppliers was a swimwear company and surfing company, and uh, they were just similar to yourself. You know, they they built up their own business, and I felt really responsible that I owed them money. Even though like, some of the big brands, you know, they didn't really care. But so I just went and worked for these guys and worked worked the debt off, if you like. And um, at the same time, I was painting warehouses. I was helping people with various things in arenas and other So I was using that to solve IT problems and business problems, as well as sweeping warehouses and sorting swimwear out. And uh, and yeah, and over a sort of three or four year period, I, I built a whole new life. I built a whole new technology me. So once again, I, I created a business again. <laughs> Um, of me running, doing IT, and I worked in sort of. I looked after lots of surfing companies, endurance businesses in the southwest of England, and at the same time, my sport carrot again was uh, this time it became running. What was the goal for you when you started running? Was it just pure health benefits, or, or did you uh, have any anything specific in mind? No, um, I wanted to get myself off off as many medication as possible. I wanted to look better. Um, I wanted to have a normal life. It was really that simple. Um, I wanted to have a life that I knew I created. I wanted to live my own life, not to live a life that was happening. And that's what it felt like. You know, I was getting up every day and it was like, what's, what's life going to throw at me today? How am I going to deal with it? So all I did was flip that. So instead of life being something that happened to me, it happened because of me. So, you know, I started making decisions about how I felt, how I lived all of it really um and and it in it very quickly you know i started earning ridiculous amounts of money four figures a week um moved to london dot com boom did some incredible stuff with some of the world's largest online businesses at the time um and 
yeah, I, I, you know, I was like, I was stunned. I was like, wow, one person really can do this in a very short space of time. You know, not only did I build a business, but I also took myself to, you know, pretty much labeled disabled to running marathons. Yeah. And not only marathons, you know, three, three forties, three, <laughs> it was getting quicker and yeah. quicker. So what did that, that period in life teach you about yourself and, and how, how has that built your character that you, that you had now? I'm, I, I had a strong character anyway. A lot of people will tell you that um, I was very stubborn, very opinionated. But what, what I also realized is my level of emotional stability or resilience was quite poor. But my, my intellectual resilience was very high. So, um, and I couldn't understand the sort of elements of negativity that was coming out. So I started to see sort of patterns in the way that I lived. So, and I started to think, well, hold on a minute. I'm the one that's creating that. I made decisions here. So it didn't resolve a lot of things. And that was to definitely to come for the next 15 years. But, you know, we are human beings and we're here to evolve. So that's, that was all about. But I, I guess one of my greatest things that I learned was just three words. And that was anything is possible. Yeah. And that has now become, uh, I think, the tagline of, of your uh, organization, Take a Challenge. Uh, yeah. What triggered you to create that? And, uh, and, and what do you want to achieve with it? Um, yeah, well, that's, that's a whole nother story. Um, within, within a few years of uh, being in London, I decided to do triathlon. So, um, I thought, you know, I, I can swim. I love being on a bike. And, um, one day I was cycling and I was on my way back from work and I used to love commuting on my bike. And, um, next thing I know, I was, um, completely in a silent place and couldn't understand what was going on. And there was just bright lights in my eyes and, two yellow supports either side of my eyes and um and it but it was completely silent and peaceful and then but there was people rushing around and within a few minutes i realized as a noise came rushing in and the extreme pain came in that i'd been hit by a car um so this was in 2002 and um it, it didn't take too long to discover that i'd broken my back and my arms um i'd broken my ribs uh, I had severe concussion. I was in a bit of a mess. So um, that was in 2002. So um, all the, the 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 consultancy work that I was doing literally literally just almost stopped within a couple of months. Just couldn't work. Um, so for the next six years, I then started all over again with another battle. And the next two years really was. It really was an ultimate mental, emotional, and physical battle. I was back on medication again, this time a very different type of medication, just to be able to do things. You know, walking was difficult. My daily challenge at times was to walk 10 meters, was, um, and that was, uh, and that that was me. You know, I'd gone from marathons and to running this highly successful consultancy to back to worse than I was years before. And for a while, I did sit there, you know, I felt really sorry for myself. I was running around going, look what happened to me, playing the whole victim game. Um, and then it, then it, I had another realization, and that was the pain was always going to be there. So I either moved with pain or I didn't. So I used the pain as, as an inspiration or if not, as a motivator to get beyond it. So I went through... Um, various spinal surgeries, uh, surgeries on my arms to get the um, get the nerve endings working again, so I could use my fingers. Um, but I was told that pretty much running and the like would be uh, an impossibility. Um, so um, I went out and found various alternatives um, of healthcare, of looking after myself, and again got this and worked out a way of how do I get fit. And because I was a diver in the past, I thought well, I, I know about core stability, I know about body movement, so I use my own body weight, and also every single day I would, say, do 10 meters, 11 meters, 12 meters, you know, I'd walk further and further, I'd do a squat on the ball, and it was just a progressive thing every single day, and eventually, uh, oh God, six years later, or five years later, I ran a, a 5K, a Nike 5K, and then the, Nike, the London Nike 10K, um, and then friends of mine, died in Afghanistan and then another mate's brother got killed in the UK on a bike and we just all got inspired to go and do something about it and that was on my 39th birthday so six years later and in 2008 not three months after that I run the Chicago Marathon well then I'd come off the medication I literally I literally took myself off the process took myself away 
um, after the the surgery, especially the spinal surgery, the pain got worse. Uh, it wouldn't go away, and we did tons and tons of physio, and it just seemed to get worse. And I thought, you know what, I've got to take this back into my own hands, and and I did. I just did. I got massively active. I got really into it. You know, every day. And I think this is a a big um, a big problem for physios, and to, that pe- they, they, people come to them expect to get fixed and aren't actually doing anything in their own life at home. You know, so. If they're seeing a physio once a week, they're popping in there and the physio's doing their thing and then the other people just go home and sit down again. Whereas I did the complete opposite. You know, I was constantly keeping active. And at the same time, I built an IT company <laughs> um, because I still had all the clients. So I went and employed people, um, although it was extremely difficult to actually live myself off the money. I was living off virtually nothing. Um, but uh, and in retrospect, probably a very bad idea because <laughs> my focus was all over the place, and I made some very very poor decisions on many occasions. But um, yeah, and then after that run, I got really inspired, and I did another marathon, and then an ultra marathon, and then a couple of triathlons, then an Ironman, then a climb the highest mountain in the world, then the ultra marathon started, and within four years, I'd run ten thousand kilometres <laughs> and uh, done various mountains and ultra runs and triathlons and uh, open water swims like you name it but i'd gone from something someone who didn't do that sort of thing to getting quite carried away and absolutely loving it at, at the same time but also getting extremely fit and having a whole new level of awareness uh, about life you know i definitely felt a sort of evolutionary process about what was going on so then take a challenge was was born out of that and i think the ideas behind it is you just uh get as many people on board and and get them uh, on their two feet and active yeah i did i did um i did an ultra run and i got about a thousand followers on twitter because of it because i was tweeting as i was going and it raised a fair few quid at the same time and uh then people started sharing their stories with me and i thought you know what that's really cool I don't want to keep sharing my story because it feels a bit narcissistic. So if I was sharing other people's stories as well, and I thought they were better than mine, so I was sharing lots of different stories. And after a while, I was sort of the go-to guy, if you like, for people who had challenges because my Twitter following was bigger than theirs. And and I thought, you know, this has got to be done positively. So I wanted to use that inspirational process to inspire other people to get active and run. And, And I know hundreds and hundreds of people have since gone out and done ultra runs and stuff through through the motivations of myself and the things i shared and i've since shared their stories so inspiration really is infectious yeah. so what can people find on the website that the website i think is uh take a challenge.org that's right take a challenge.org um for a couple of years it was just just a blog about me and then in 2011 we launched it or i launched it as the website as you see today and it's got uh, hundreds of inspirational stories so it's split into there's sort of three elements to the website inspiration education and activation the inspiration is the inspirational stories of other people real people doing incredible things um and that's supposed to obviously evoke that that motivational inspirational feeling that people get when they when they are inspired by something and the second part is the edu- educational element. So this is doctors, scientists, athletes um, who are all providing information and just normal people like myself providing uh, blogs and articles on their own experiences on various elements of life, but also including things like nutrition. Um, um, and I've taken it a new twist as well recently in terms of going down the social responsibility route. You know, are we sourcing our food from the right places as well as is, is it organic? Are we eating foods that aren't don't actually help her, help our bodies at all in terms of the uh, the repair process? Because obviously, I've learned a lot about repairing my own body on, a number of times, and one of the contributory factors of that has been food. So, and and then I've taken it to a whole new level of the whole well being side as well. So mixing lots of elements into one site, which I don't think you get from uh, other websites like things like Runners World that just have inspiration and then. And it is all just about running, but not all other things. And I think Runners World's a great site. I think they all are. So I think what I love about Take Challenge as a platform, we, we, we share all, everybody's stuff. So you end up with this sort of one place where you can come and find other bits of information that might help. Um, and then the next stage, which won't really be launched until 2015, is a big activation piece. And that's to plug lots of events into the website. So events from all over the world. So not only will it be a place where you can read and learn, 
but also you can connect with places where you can go and do something. Feel, yeah. learn, do. Cool. So what are the typical excuses that you hear from people for, for not exercising and, and how do you respond to that? Oh, God, everything. Um, I don't have enough time is the favorite one. Um, and the minute someone says that, that means you, you're the very person that needs to make time. Because if you don't have enough time, you're, it, it, it's a, a misnomer that, that we, we don't have enough time. Um, people are very good at filling their time up with stuff they shouldn't do. And I have a great um, uh, process where I, I make people put the priorities of time into a sort of clock on a daily basis and then work that out in a week. And often you'll find that people watch TV 22 to 30, 40 hours a week. Um, they'll, they do the things of least priority first because they're the easiest. <laughs> and one of those is normally working. And working and sitting down all day causes us a, a lot of problems. Um, and also the biggest one is learning to say no. A lot of people will happily consistently say yes to uh, friends, family, the boss. To, that They'll just give their life away. You know, they're literally just living to work or they're living to please people consistently instead of actually thinking, you know, what do I actually want? I'm only here once. Yeah. Well, thanks for saying uh, yes to my invite for coming on the show then. <laughs> much much appreciated. Um, what are your top tips for people who have a hard time getting motivated and, and, you know, get them off the couch? Do you know what? This all comes down to mental and emotional ability and personal responsibility. Now, what I would say is the very first thing is you need to feel inspired. You need to understand what you're doing it for. If you're doing it because you want to make other people happy or you want attention from other people, it will go wrong somewhere down the road. You need to learn, what am I doing this for? Why am I doing it for myself? And you need to learn that that's a benefit so that you're not giving something up. Because if you feel you're giving something up, you're always in a place of loss. And if you're in a place of loss, you're always feeling you're losing out. Um, and this is the problem with dieting. The process of a diet is I'm no longer allowed to that. Now, the words allowed means you're looking outside of you and saying that someone says what you are and aren't allowed to eat. When actually, if you take personal responsibility, it's I'm not going to eat that. It's a completely different way of talking to yourself. So part of the process is learning how to talk to yourself. And if, once you're talking to yourself in a really positive way, even though the negative mind is there, once you can learn to ignore the, the, the thoughts that come up that often aren't ours, they're things we've been taught from, from childhood, from social conditioning, that we need to be a certain way, we should live a certain way, and shoulds and coulds are the worst things that we can ever say. It's what do we want to do, how do we want to live? And then most of all, do something you love. When you're doing something you love and it makes you happy, do it. Just keep doing more of it. The problem we have with endurance sport is that, you know, it's, it's pretty time consuming. And uh, especially you know, people who have families and kids, um, it's always a difficult balance there. I mean, I have a, personally, I have, I have two small children. And, you know, I have a, if I have to go out on a bike ride on Saturday morning or I can spend three hours playing with my kids, that choice is easily made and I'm staying at home. Um, how, how do you deal with that? Absolutely. Well, for me, very different. I'm, I'm, I'm in a relationship, but I don't have any children. Um, but the way I've always dealt with that, and I know that many other people do this, is that um, I created 6am Club, and that was getting up really in the morning before the world was awake, really, and getting what you're doing out of the way. Also, the, the thing about 6am Club, the thing about starting early in the morning you are setting an intention for the rest of your day. Uh, it's incredibly important that you do that. It's not just about health and fitness thing here. It, it's all about, it's also about inspiration. It's also about setting the mind in the right place for the entire day. When you get up in the morning, you drag yourself out of bed and you go and do that first thing in the morning, you're literally saying, I'm starting the day my way, the right way, and I'm doing it for me. And, and that I would say that, especially for people with, with kids, you need to be looking at the time. And also, if you're in a loving relationship where you've got a good level of communication, you need to be talking to each other to say, how can, how can I get time for me to be able to do this? I think it's extremely important that parents teach their children that it's really important that you do things for yourself. 
because one day they the kids are going to be on their own and they're going to th- and if they think that they have to be consistent and reliant on people to get their needs met because they haven't learned that from the actions not the words of parents but the actions and the very action of a parent going right i need to take myself for my one hour run in the morning shows that they are still taking time for themselves and it's important that's not a selfish act it's a very positive act and i think yes it's difficult to juggle all that time but it's really important to look at what's the priority in your life you know what's how much time do we spend watching tv how much time which you know tv is pretty much pointless these days how much time do we do spend doing things that don't really serve us in our lives yeah all right cool I think I'll be launching the 5 a.m. club then because my little one uh, wakes up at 6. So. Yeah, I that a lot. To me, that's a 6 a.m. club anyway. It's just, <laughs> just the name. Yeah, cool. Um, so what's what's next for you? Do, do you have like a bucket list of races or events that you still want to do? Yeah, well, I took a year off. So um, I was going to do a um, – I was going to go to the North Pole, uh, well, beyond the North Pole in 2015. Um, yeah. But that for me personally, that became a bit of a personal ego trip and the time that I was going to spend into it could be better spent on some of the programs that we're doing and take a challenge. And one of those that we've already launched is a leadership and mentoring program for young people. So that there are varying lengths and we inspire uh, basically over 14 year olds to um, with, a, with a process I developed called Steps and a whole bunch of leaders and mentors to inspire these people using exercise and life skill and new, new types of life skills to get out there and make and make changes to their lives. Um, so that's where I've been. I've spent a lot of time on the website and actually the community itself and developing it and building these processes. Um, and then for me personally, next year, I'm getting back into ultra running. Um, my first one is probably going to be one I've done before, and that is to run from uh, uh, the uh, Richmond to Oxford, a uh, 100 miler. All right, good luck with that. Um, so how can people connect with you, Chris? Because you're pretty active on social media, so I think uh, Twitter and Facebook will be the best way. Yeah, Twitter's definitely my, my big thing. I love Twitter. It's a really great way to interact with people, although I've been pretty poor at it <laughs> at times uh, due to how busy I get in life. But, uh, yeah, that or people can email me at chris at takeachallenge.org. I'm happy to receive emails. I do get a lot, so uh, please be patient. All right, cool. I'll definitely make sure to put all the links uh take a challenge and, and, and 6 a.m club 6 p.m club and everything uh, in the show notes for for people to access fantastic thank you anything else you want to plug uh no i think that's it really um you know one of the things we're going to do at the moment is we're just about to launch an investment process we're already uh, we already take donations for the um the uh the leadership and mentor programs uh it's, it's about 250 quid and that gets a kid through uh, anything from a 14 to a 20 year old right into a pro- into a weekly program um and We've got some amazing stories with some of those guys. But we'll also be launching an investment process soon to grow the business, um, to launch it uh, on, on the global stage. It's already got the largest audience is American, secondly the UK, and then uh, Canada, South Africa, and Australia. So it really is a global global proposition, and um, I'm, I'm inspired to get it out there to as many people as possible. And that will also be accessible through uh, takeachallenge.org? Yeah, yeah, that's the whole thing. Everything's going to be on there. Um, and if people have got inspirational stories or they want to blog from the site, let's say they've got a great story or something, yeah, contact us. We'd love to hear from them. All right, cool. All right, Chris, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Cheers. Thanks, Peter.